based on the courts, at least granting some, uh, you know, weight to to Stepani's arguments in the motion to dis in, in denying the motion to dismiss, it sounds like maybe the court does think he's got a chance there. Welcome to Price File. Welcome back, everyone. This is Mike with Price Paul, and once again, we're bringing back Nick Jingo of the Renner Auto Intellectual Property Law Firm in Cleveland, Ohio. In an earlier video, hi Nick, how's it going lately? <laughs> Pretty good, how are you? Yeah, thanks again. Doing great. Thanks again for uh, for joining us here on this uh, segment. So earlier on, we'll make a link back to the, to the video, and we're also going to link in the description to all the PDFs we're going to talk about here. But we uh, we talked about what was happening with the Jim Stepani and PhD Fitness. A lawsuit where bodybuilding.com actually sued Jim Stepani and PhD Fitness over who owns the gym brand and the gym kind of mark, so to say. And so we kind of came to a conclusion at the end of that, uh, at the end of that video. And users can watch it and they can learn a little bit about you. We learned that you know this contract was so vague that it could really go a few different ways. And so yeah. we have some new updates. A lot of people have been posting, hey, what's the latest updates on this? Uh, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing the gym brand at both GNC and Amazon and bodybuilding.com. So what's been going on? And uh, there have been some updates on March 15th, some new, new documents dropped. And they're pretty compl complicated from a layman's perspective. So I figured it's a great chance to have you come back on. Yeah, uh, happy to be on, happy to come back. Um, I, when we talked before, uh, we had, you know, made note that, that there'd be a lot more here and there, there already is. Um, like you said, March 15th, uh, the court issued an order deciding um, a pending motion to dismiss. The motion was bodybuilding.com's motion and it was a motion to dismiss uh, two counterclaims that uh, Stepani and PhD had raised in their uh, answer. So- Okay, so let's just like walk it back real quickly. Bodybuilding.com sues PhD. Okay. Yep. And PhD, was this like them counter suing or is this just like counter claims? Yeah. So bodybuilding.com sues PhD and Sapani together, um, files a complaint um, alleging trademark infringement in various different formats. Then uh, Stepani and PhD file an answer, which is what you have to do when you get a complaint. In their answer, they deny all the allegations mm -hmm. by bodybuilding and then also include what's called counterclaims which is basically just a cross lawsuit. So they, they said, no, we, we're not infringing your trademark. And in fact, you're infringing our trademark. <laughs> gotcha. And so these, the two counterclaims that were at issue in this. So, so the answer, so complaint answer, and then there's a response to the counterclaims filed by bodybuilding, which just denies those. That's, that's all of the initial pleadings. At that point, uh, bodybuilding.com then moved. Well, so there was some motions for preliminary injunction, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay. But, for, for now, we'll talk about the, the, the motion to dismiss. After the initial pleadings, bodybuilding.com filed a motion asking the court to strike uh, the first two counterclaims of, actually it was three. Three counterclaims? One, two, three counterclaims. Is, uh, the three counterclaims in the answer. Um, the, the first one had to do with uh, federal trademark infringement. The second one had to do with Idaho registered trademark infringement, and the third one had to do with Idaho common law trademark infringement. So those were the three counterclaims that bodybuilding.com asked the court to, to, to strike from the case. Um, their argument being that Stepani and PhD hadn't um, alleged sufficient facts to, 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 to state a plausible claim for relief. That's the standard. Um, parties briefed it up. That was where the agreement kind of came into play, and that's what we talked about uh, right. in the last video was that this this joint development agreement um, that you had linked to previously and I'm sure you'll link to again mm -hmm. um, basically what it came down to and what we talked about then was who who owned the marks slash who uh, had a license to use the marks and at the time like you said at, the gist of it was the agreement's not very clear um, to be honest with you I kind of thought that the court would lean more towards bodybuilding um, but as we'll talk about, um, it, following briefing on this motion, the court actually declined to dismiss uh, two of those three counterclaims. Um, so basically, uh, plaintiff um, bodybuilding.com argued uh, 
uh, for dismissing these counterclaims based on sections 8.2 and 20 of that agreement, which had to do with the uh, a license. And, and the survival of it too after. What's that? Yeah. And, right. Um, and and bodybuilding.com's argument was, look, you, if you look at the agreement, we obviously have a worldwide royalty-free perpetual license. Therefore, we can't infringe any trademarks under either the federal or state law trademarks. Um, the defendants, Sapani and PhD, count, counter argued that in fact they own the mark and that the license ended when the agreement expired. And we talked a little bit about basically their what turned out to be their best argument was kind of this argument that, look, Your Honor, if you read the contract to have granted them this worldwide royalty free perpetual license, that's that's there's no way we actually would have signed. It, it can't mean that we wouldn't. We never would have signed an agreement that meant that. Um, so as it turns out, the, the court actually bought it. Um, so they're saying, hey, this is so preposterous that it wouldn't have. You, yeah, it's basically, look, Your Honor, you can't read the contract that way because it's ridiculous, um, which is kind of crazy. I mean, it's basically like it's almost like a reward for writing a terrible or agreeing to a terrible <laughs> contract. Um, and so no, but, you didn't see that coming, really. I didn't see that coming. And so I, just so everyone's kind of clear, there's a lot of back and forth here. We've been kind of going on. Um, this is a big win for the Stepani side of things. Then. Is that correct? It is. Um, In a way, yeah. like it's not, I, I'm not sure. See, that's what I want to ask is like, it seems like a win for, for Stepani's side and everything is, I'm not sure if the judge is saying Stepani's right or if the judge is kind of saying, no, let's hear this out. Yeah, it, more the latter. Um, so I kind of said it briefly before that basically this, the, what the, the question the court's really answering answering here is, has the defendant in its counterclaims stated a plausible claim for relief? That's it. If the answer to that is yes, motion denied. The answer to that is no, motion granted, and the counterclaims go away. So it's a really low bar. I right. mean, for, for, it was a really low bar for Stefani to meet. Nonetheless, I'm still kind of su surprised the court held that he met it. And, and because the question hinges on the language in the contract, while this isn't by any means a determinative decision, it certainly gives an indication that the court's willing to consider mm -hmm. that this contract is very unclear and that what he's saying at least has some basis in the language of the contract. So it, it is a win for Stefani, I'd say. I mean, if, these, if all of these counterclaims would have been denied, this case would be over, basically. Right, well, that was so, big. Yeah, so so you avoided a big decision, I guess. Really, is more probably the more appropriate way to say it. Okay. Um, the one of the counterclaims was dismissed, um, so he was two he was two for three here. Um, but the the one that was dismissed was actually the one that had to do with Idaho registered trademark mm -hmm. infringement, and the court dismissed it because there is no Idaho registered trademark. Um, and I I didn't look into it too much. I thought it was kind of funny that. I don't know if maybe they accidentally included the statutory language for registered trademarks or what, but the court seemed kind of like pretty dismissive of the whole thing. We're just like, yeah, that, that one goes away because there's no registered trademark, but I'll, so I'll focus more on this other stuff. So, okay. so that one, that was the only, that was the, the lone loss. If you see, if you look in the order, it says some things are granted, some things are denied. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what the court was. The court parsed out each counterclaim and, and then dealt with each one. So, gotcha. So, um, for you as a lawyer, when you see something like Idaho trademark come up, and I, I assume you're only uh, in the o Ohio bar, I, I'm not sure if that's the right way of pronouncing that, but um, how, what, what do you have to do? Do you have to get an Idaho-based attorney then in that case? Uh, not necessarily. Um, there's lots of complicated rules about right. um, practicing law without a license and things like that. But um, basically, so we talked, we talked a lot mm -hmm. <laughs> about trademarks in general in the last call. And, um, you know, we talked about there being federal trademarks, state trademarks, um, registration wise. Um, basically every state has a trademark register. Um, Ohio does too. The reality is that it's kind of, if you're going to spend the money and we, I think I said this before, if you're going to spend the money to register a trademark with the state, you're better off just spending it and registering with the, with the federal government because you've got national coverage instead of just the state. Mm -hmm. So, State trademark claims are typically brought along with federal trademark claims. Like, like in this case, it's kind of like a belt and suspenders type of thing. Um, in that situation, 
um, those claims kind of go just go along with the federal claims, and that's why it's in federal court, even though they're state technically state law claims. Gotcha. Okay, so the other stuff's bigger, obviously. Um, yeah, the federal the federal trademark claims are where the real issue is going to be. Okay, so we all rise rise or fall together. What do you what do you foresee happening next? Um, or how, in so, a typical case, what would happen next? So in a typical case, things will keep moving. I mean, the, the pleadings haven't changed because the the counterclaims are still there, most of them. So discovery will keep moving along. I'm pretty sure they're in discovery. It's kind of hard to tell from the from the public uh, publicly available stuff on Pacer what's going on in discovery because discovery is all outside. Excuse me, outside of that. Like mm-hmm. so, discovery is asking and re- asking for and receiving information and documents between the two parties. Um, I'm guessing. I didn't look at the order. I'm guessing that'll go through the summer, um, and that. And and then at the end of discovery, there's usually another big round of briefs called motions for summary judgment, um, which I would expect. However, and I, I mentioned to this this to you before we went live here, there there are a couple other briefs that are still like pe- they're pending, and they, the court hasn't dealt with them yet. Um, so part of the initial pleadings, in addition to the answer and and response and counterclaims, was a motion actually cross motions for what's called a preliminary injunction. So um, bodybuilding.com is seeking a ruling from the court that during the pendency of the case, Stepani and PhD should not be allowed to use the gym mark or trade dress. Conversely, Stepani and PhD have asked for the same thing the other way. And so is that going to be, is, does that, does the judge need to decide that like next or is there an order of events or is it, cause that, that, that would be big. That would, that would be big money for someone. It, it would be a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's always up to the judge as far as the control of their docket. I mean, it, the judge could sit on it forever. The judge could rule on it tomorrow. I, a ruling on it would be nice because it will create leverage for somebody. Assuming that the court enjoins someone so assuming the court stops someone from using it, it's going to create an adi- additional leverage for purposes of settlement. Um, this is a weird case, though. <laughs> I'd almost be surprised if the court enjoined anybody at this point because of the way the court ruled on Stepani's uh, or ruled on the motion to dismiss. Um, so, so in order to, to to get a preliminary injunction, you have to prove four things. You have to show that you have a likelihood of success on the merits, that you have a likelihood of suffering irreparable harm if uh, there is no injunction granted. Um, you have to show that the equities are in your favor and you have to show that it would be in the public's interest to grant your motion for a preliminary hmm. injunction. So because there's cross motions, they, they kind of both argued everything, which is kind of unique. Um, going through those factors, likelihood of success on the merits, which basically just means who's, who's more likely to win the overall argument of trademark infringement, like I said, I, you know, if you would have asked me, um, well, when you asked me two months ago, I would have leaned towards um, bodybuilding uh, based on the language in the contract. But I, I think maybe I, maybe I, but maybe I put too much weight in that. Mm-hmm. Um, based on the courts, at least granting some, uh, you know, weight to to Stepani's arguments in the motion to dis- in, in denying the motion to dismiss, it sounds like maybe the court does think he's got a chance there. And if, if that's the case, then maybe likely the success on the merits goes actually goes his way. Hmm. Um, the other the other factor, you know, likelihood likely to suffer irreparable harm in the absence of an injunction, I think that's a wash. I mean, if if nobody's enjoined, everybody kind of keeps doing what they're doing. And so I don't think anybody's going to be overly harmed. Favored by the equities, that one has to do with maintaining the status quo. And I think bodybuilding.com has a decent argument there that the status quo is they are the exclusive supplier of gym brand products. And therefore, in order to favor the, in order to keep the status quo, an injunction in their favor would be, would be necessary. Similarly with the public interest, consumers are being confused here. I mean, you said it yourself. Right. People are people are wondering why they're seeing this brand all over the place from different suppliers, mm-hmm. which makes me think that the court might want to enjoin someone or everyone. <laughs> I mean, 
because it, because at the end of the day, and I don't think this will happen. I, I think I think more generally, uh, the courts and and the public have kind of gotten away from the basic consumer confu confusion protection system that trademarks really are supposed to be. Hmm. But the reality here is this: we are currently in a very confusing situation. Nobody knows where this stuff's coming from. Or, well, you know who it's coming from, I and mean, people know it's one of two suppliers, but it is still pretty confusing. So no, At the same time, you really don't just because the supplements are made in a factory that I could never tell you where they're at. So that's, I, I guess, that's, and, and, that's, but that's a lot of supplements. That's the majority of supplements, really. And yeah. So I'm not sure how a court would weigh that, but. Right, right. But so, yeah, so that's, so that's, that's probably what I would guess will happen next. I mean, we, so we got the, let's see, the, the decision on the motion to dismiss was in mid March. So we're like a March, April, we're like a month and a half out from that. So I guess my thought would be if it, we were going to get a decision on the preliminary injunction stuff, which I think was actually briefed before the motion to dismiss, we probably already would have got it. Um, so maybe, maybe the court's going to let it go a little ways. Hmm. Which, and the longer the court lets it go, the more it starts to seem like nobody's going to get enjoined, um, because obviously the court doesn't isn't that worried about people being confused or harmed. Um, the longer it goes, that's just kind of common sense way to look at it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but that's so that's that's where it's at. I, you know, I think I think Stepani dodged a bullet, um, and and all and, mo and at least the big counterclaims are still around. Uh, I think, and like you said, I think part of this too is the court just wants to see how this is going to play out. I think discovery is going to ramp up. Things are going to start to get more expensive. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of money is spent in discovery typically because you've got attorneys pouring over documents and, and going back and forth in correspondence with each other and taking depositions and things like that. And I think that's, that, that's what's going to happen now. I mean, I think the parties are going to kind of settle in and, and start start chipping away at each other as far as that goes. So how, do, how does discovery work in terms of the details? Like, um, let's say, I, I think Stepani had a Gmail account, for instance. I mean, tons of people have Gmail accounts. So let's say there is a Gmail account involved in a case and we need to, we want to see, you know, the relevant evidence. How does this work? Do you, does, does one lawyer ask for it from the other team or do we get like subpoena Google? Like how does, I, I have no clue. Right. I've always kind of wondered about that Yeah. in discovery. Um, so discovery in general is typically starts off with written discovery requests they're called and these are actually like and you you'll see them sometimes like i wouldn't be surprised if some show up there will let me put it this way there will definitely be a fight about discovery at some point in this case because <laughs> there is in every case mm -hmm. and when that fight happens somebody's discovery requests or responses will get posted on pacer but and and when they do when they are you'll see that it's basically each side, each side exchange, exchanges discovery requests with the other side. And, and those requests can take the form of requests for production, which is asking the other side to actually give you documents, interrogatories, which are questions that are posed to the other side for response, like a written response. Or there's actually things called requests for admission, where you literally say, admit or deny the following fact. And, that, and then they admit or deny it. Um, and it's in those discovery requests that, that one party will seek, for example, like you said, emails about certain topics. And, and so what, what you end up seeing is things like, you know, please provide all documents related to, you know, uh, I mean, they can be really broad, all documents related to the development of the gym mark. Mm -hmm. and, and, excuse me, you know, all email, and, and it varies from, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Like here in Ohio, we have some pretty, um, um, strict electronic discovery rules. So electronic discovery is things like emails. Um, as recently as five, six years ago, the easiest way to crush a small opposing party was to ask for a lot of electronic discovery because you would force them to search servers worth of stuff mm -hmm. and produce thousands and thousands of emails based on really broad, like I just said, you know, anything related to J JYM. Which was right? probably all of his emails pretty much. Exactly. Yeah. You can imagine that's going to be a ton of documents. So at least in the, in the Northern District of Ohio, we have rules about, there's kind of like the stepwise, first you, first each side identifies custodians, like pe people who likely have, because the thing is you don't even have to limit it to a person technically. Like you could just say, 
you know, I'm from PhD fitness. I'm, I want everything the PhD has in its custody, possession, or control related to Jim. And that would be his emails, everybody else's emails, um, paper documents, presentations, anything. Um, so it's, it can get insane. So hmm. at least in the Northern District of Ohio, and, and the parties can agree to this as well, you can kind of narrow it down to, I want electronic, I want emails from these three people. Here's the keywords I want you to search and send me the, send me the results. Um, but that's how it goes. And, and that, but that, I mean, if he had a Gmail account and they ask for stuff that's in there, he has to produce it unless it's privileged or confident attorney client proof well, unless it's attorney client privilege mm -hmm. or attorney work product those are the two the only two reasons you have to not produce stuff but we'd be like talking about emails from 2013 or something so most which if they were between him and an, an attorney mm -hmm. only right gotcha privileged and you wouldn't have to turn them over gotcha if otherwise then it's fair game right now what if um there is a, another case where some emails got exposed that were not there is, you know, let's say there's four parties involved in an email mm -hmm. and during discovery, you ask for all emails related to X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. And then the party gives up everything that supposedly is related to X, Y, Z. And then one of the other four people on the email thread actually forwards you a little bit more that was not disclosed. Kind yeah. of saw this in another recent case. What, are there penalties for that? Like what happens when that is that that's illegal? Yeah, it is. It's, it's a violate. I mean, it's well illegal it's a it's a violation of the federal rules of civil procedure um and the result can be a, it's called a discovery sanctions mm -hmm. and i mean depending on the egregiousness um the court can the court can do all kinds of things i mean like i said with the court and, and their discretion with respect to the their schedule they have pretty wide discretion with respect to discovery sanctions too i mean it could be as you know something like um you're deemed to have admitted everything or certain things. Um, you're 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 not allowed to produce evidence on this or that issue. Um, you know, it, depending on if it, if it had to do with an expert, maybe that expert's no longer allowed to testify. Hmm. <laughs> things like that. Gotcha. It, a lot of it depends, though, on like how much prejudice arose out of the situation. So, like in your hypothetical, if that extra little thing wasn't discovered until really late, and you know, the night of trial or something. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a lot of prejudice. If if they produced documents and then they were like, oh, we forgot this one disc, here, here you go, and they sent it like a week later and it was still well in the middle of discovery, right. it's, it's kind of no harm, no foul type right. of thing. So that, but yeah, that, I mean, that, that happens, I mean, it doesn't happen a ton on purpose, but you can imagine with this many documents floating around, the, the, so there's a discovery period, it's, it's an amount of time. So. So, you, so if you receive a set of discovery requests, you have 30 days to respond. But then your duty to supplement your response is ongoing. So, and the discovery period can be, a couple, you know, three, six months. So you could imagine you get a discovery request at the beginning, you search all your stuff, but there, you know, as, as things, as you become aware of more things during discovery, you have to produce those too. It's not just one cut at it. So that's that's kind of so that's that's probably what the parties are doing right right now. so that that gets really expensive so when you see a case um at the point where it's at right now does that increase the likelihood of settlement just because this is when things start getting really costly in terms of legal fees yeah i mean so the kind of the two things that create settlement touch points or settlement nodes would be orders on briefs so like this order on this motion to dismiss if if it would have come out differently that would have created that would have created a settlement mm -hmm. point. Um, the way it came out, I don't think it does. Um, hmm. Right before discovery ramps up, so so you know, it's possible that the parties agreed, you know, offline not to not to serve any discovery until this motion was ruled on. Right. Um, now that it's ruled on, it's possible that the parties are like, okay, well, before we go any further, let's reassess settlement. I mean, that's typically when I would reassess settlement with a client is right before we're gonna. You know, it's either like, okay, we're either going to go all in on discovery or we should think about taking whatever money that's going to be and maybe use that for settlement. Right. Um, once you get into discovery, it kind of, it's kind of go, you know, go big or go home. I mean, you can't, <laughs> if you go, you, if you go halfway, now you've, now you've kind of pocket committed, you've already spent a bunch of money. You kind of just got to finish up discovery. And then kind of the next touch point will be at the end of the discovery period. Both parties kind of assess okay, how, what's the strength of my position now in light of all the facts? 
because that's the idea of discovery is to develop all the facts. Mm -hmm. At that point, it's usually kind of a possibility. Before, and again, that's before that's after settlement and before motions for summary judgment, which is another big expenditure. Um, assuming the parties decide to go from there, then you've got motions for summary judgment, and then you're going to wait till you get an order from the court again because you've already spent the money. So, so I think the, I think now or within the last month, I would guess the parties probably talked about discovery or talked about settlement. I'm, since nothing came of it, I wouldn't be surprised if if they just go if they go now through summary judgment. Wow. Okay. So um, with a lot of the stuff in discovery, we're not really going to see anything. We, we, we don't get to see everything. We only get to see what's yeah. getting submitted as evidence uh, in support of their motions for summary judgment. Did right. That right. Yeah. <laughs> there'll be, yeah, there'll be thousands of thousands and thousands of documents, pages of documents exchanged. And this is how it is in every case. Right. The reality is it'll come down to 20 or 30. Actually. Right. Mm -hmm. so those are the things you'll see. What will happen is in the motion for summary judgment, each side will kind of like queue it up for the judge. Like it'll be a motion and then in support of the motion, there'll be a declaration mm -hmm. by an attorney and attached to the declaration will be all these exhibits and all those exhibits will be documents. You know, there'll be, I'm sure it'll be something like a bunch of emails to and from somebody that say certain things that'll, that'll be, I'm sure a lot of the evidence um, because they're gonna get it. They're gonna have to get into what the license really means. So there's going to be, a, I think that's probably what most of the discovery is going to revolve around, really. Interesting. Okay, yeah. so at this point, before discovery, I, I, and I'm asking you for an estimate here, so you can say whatever you want, but I've, I'd like to know like about how much an attorney's fees would it have been before discovery in your estimation? And if we go to full discovery, I mean, it, it's probably anyone's game, but are you paying uh, like $500 an hour lawyers to do all that stuff? Or are there like, you know... For discovery? Yeah, during discovery. Uh, I mean, usually you have younger attorneys like associates or, or, I mean, they're actually, you can actually hire some basic document review out to non-attorneys just for real quick, like basic calling, but it still ends up being pretty expensive. I mean, if, if I had to guess, I mean, there's, I mean, you've got two rounds of fairly big briefing done already, mm -hmm. um, which is somewhat uncommon. I mean, so, I mean, you're, I, I would guess both parties are into six figures already. Okay. Um, but I, I mean, that's just a, a guess. But I, I wouldn't be surprised because the the, the, brief, the briefs are, briefs are pretty expensive because you've you've got attorneys spending days and days writing these things and mm -hmm. editing and researching and, and going through what evidence they do have to support it. And and so I I would guess they're probably both parties are probably up over six figures or yeah. close to. And the honest truth is that's probably not that much to them. Um, that's true. Considering yeah. how much we've seen that they're both both sides are making have right. made on this in the past yeah, exactly. few years, but it's still exactly. a lot. And that's the, and that's the, kind of the the recipe for a, a long drawn out case. Is, huh. You know, once your fees, once your attorney's fees start exceeding how much you're actually going to make on something, it starts to make make no sense to pursue it. But if if they're making what we think they're making, and I know you talked about in our video, mm -hmm. then that's if, you're right. A hundred thousand dollars probably is nothing to them. Interesting. And then yeah. once it, but yeah, once it goes to discovery, I mean, could it be like in the millions or a million maybe? Uh, that'd be a lot. I, I mean, and the reason I say that is typically trademark cases are not super document intensive. Right. Like, like a patent, patent cases typically are, are more expensive. And to take a patent case through trial over the course of a year or two, you, you may get up around seven figures. Um, but that's because you're you're looking at a you're way further into the documents. There's a lot more time spent on, um, without getting into detail, but a lot more time spent attacking the other patent. There's actually like two. There's infringement and invalidity, and there's a, so there's almost like two cases going on in a patent case. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't know that they'll get up that high, um, but I mean, taking my estimate out, I mean, so you figure that maybe they're spending you know. 30 to 50 per round of briefing you've got you've got summary judgment briefing so that so that's going to be maybe another 30 to 50 and to get there you've got discovery which which could be 50, you know north of 50 itself so that's another so mm -hmm. you're, you're like 100 you know through summary judgment another 100 maybe um, maybe more depending on what happens in discovery because this discovery could get expensive too because and actually this will be interesting to see is 
in addition to written discovery, there's there's also depositions, which is sworn testimony. You've got a, a witness and you've got an attorney for both sides. And the attorney taking the deposition is is cross-examining the witness and asking the witness questions under oath with a court reporter there. It's typically videotaped. And the other attorney's there to defend them just like in court. Um, and it can go all day, eight hours. Uh, and typically, you know, in this case, there isn't a lot of written discovery, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's quite a few depositions of, of the people, the higher ups at all these different right. companies and about their state of mind and what they were thinking and what was going on and who said what around that time. So that can add up pretty quick because you figure, eight, you know, I mean, these, I think, I don't know, who are the firms? I mean, even, you know, figure three or $400 an hour for a senior level litigator times eight hours just the day of the, the deposition, that's 20, 2,500, 2,500 bucks, $5,000 if they prepared the day before. Do you sometimes have to pay the person getting deposed too? Like I, some of these guys are no longer at bodybuilding.com. Uh, you know, they're at different companies and stuff. So uh, you got to pull them away from their day job. Is that legal or how does that? It is. Yeah, unfortunately. So the, so <laughs> for people that are employed by the parties, the, um, they just have to appear, um, leave. But there's, I know there's a federal rule about compensating people who are deposed, but it, I mean, the, the amount is not commensurate with what they will be making. Okay. It's like, it's like your mileage under the federal mileage rules, which is like 40 cents a mile right. or something. Right, right, right. I think like a stipend for lunch or something. It's definitely not worth And that, And actually, d depositions are, are a pain. I mean, they, those, those can create leverage if if you've got people who are busy and don't want to deal with it again not necessarily in this case because there's so much money involved and it seems like this is i mean this is like this is stepani and phd's baby mm -hmm. i can't imagine him or them deciding to roll over because they don't want to sit in a deposition for a day right um, right in smaller cases that can be a determining factor i mean it's eight hours out of your day or two you know two days out of your life at minimum to, to go to go sit and get yelled at by an attorney <laughs> Sounds, yeah, um, I've read some depositions and it, you can feel the tensity just read, you know, reading yeah, it's, them and it's, it, yeah. it seems I mean, nerve-wracking. It's, it's, uh, it's not court, but it's, it's it, a lot of the times those depositions get played in court. So, I mean, it's, it's not a whole lot short of that, really. Right. Okay. Well, yeah. Any, anything else to add about this? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think we'll just wait and see what happens. Like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if we get some sort of action on discovery disputes. Um, I mentioned that earlier, you know, what happens is a party will look at discovery requests and say, I can't answer these, they're too vague or, or they're too onerous. And so they'll refuse to produce documents and the parties will go back and forth and then they'll complain to the judge. And then the judge may or may not grant discovery from one or the other. So that, that may crop up. That's, tip, that's kind of typical for gotcha. a bigger case. But mm -hmm. other than that, I think, you know, we wait and see what the court does with the preliminary injunction motions and once discovery closes, we see if summary judgment pops up. Gotcha. All right. So when we originally wrote about this, I uh, I, I wrote that it felt, in my opinion, it seemed like Stepani was pushing all his chips in the table. And I'm going to stand by what I said there. And I think it's going to continue to happen. So I know a lot of people have, you know, sent me emails or texts or whatever saying, oh, I, you know, I hear this is going to, this is going to settle. I'm going to say, it just happens to go out on a limb and say, I don't think this is going to settle right now. Uh, given that, I, I originally believe that Stepani was putting all the chips on the table and that it seems like he at least dodged some bullets and got some stuff to go his way and that the judge would hear it out. I don't I don't see a reason for settlement at this point. And so that's my that's me personally, uh, you know, my opinion. You can feel free to add in, but that's kind of like I'm sticking to it. I think this is going to get crazy or continue to stay crazy because uh, because both the, the judges seem to be willing to hear it out. So why quit now? Yeah, I, I think that's very reasonable position to take. I mean, I think, like you said, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of money at stake here. Um, these are big brands that are doing, or a big brand that's doing well. It still is, uh, right. And it is a very open question as, to, it, there's no clear winner here. I mean, <laughs> you were surprised by the motion to dismiss ruling. So given that, and kind of what we know about the, the industry in general, mm -hmm, I can right. totally see, I could totally see this thing going going all the way or, or at least through summary judgment right uh, which is a big chunk so yeah I, if i was a betting man i'd say that's probably that's probably not a bad bad angle to take gotcha 
All right, well, Nick, thank you so much once again for joining us here. And uh, if anyone needs an, an IP attorney, Nick Jingo is your man at the Renner Auto Law Firm. I'll uh, have your logo down at the bottom of this, and we'll make links to your website and everything as well. And so uh, thanks again for joining us. Subscribe to our channel. We're, we're, in, we're in on this case at this point, so we're going to have to keep updating these blog posts and everything. And, uh, and right now the position is that, that's gonna, that we think it's going to keep going. So uh, Mike here with Price Ball. Thanks again for listening.